Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this session of the Cities and Environments Research Network Dialogues for 2023. Uh, I am, for those of you who don't know me, if anyone joining me doesn't know me, <laughs> uh, I am Carion, currently a PhD student and tutor at the University of Melbourne School of Culture and Communication. Um, before we formally begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the unceded lands of the Wurjuri people of the Kulin Nation and I pay respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Um, and if anyone is joining us for the first time, the Cities and Environments Research Network is a gathering of postgraduate scholars, PhD candidates, postdocs, and lecturers who are primarily based in Australian universities with research in the juncture of urbanization, the built environment, climate change and disaster, public acts, learning environments, informality, and allied fields as they relate to the Philippine and Filipino context. So for this discussion, uh, just a gentle reminder, uh, uh, we'd like to request everyone to turn off their video cameras and keep their audio muted in order to preserve bandwidth and to ensure that the presentations um, are given without distraction. Um, Okay, so we uh, the webinar is scheduled to last for approximately um, two hours. I will hear until 7 p.m. in Melbourne time. So each, uh, each of our two speakers will have around 20 to 30 minutes, um, after which we will um, open the floor for Q&A. We remain then for a limited time so we need to accommodate questions afterwards. Um, okay, for our first speaker, I'd like to introduce uh, Dondi Ramos, who is a PhD history researcher at the Australian Catholic University. He studies collective memory and memorialization of the Spanish Empire and the D Dutch East India Company. His thesis is part of an ARC linkage project called Mobilizing Dutch East India Company Collections for New Global Stories. He is currently assistant professor at the University of the Philippines Department of History. Uh, using memorial sites like monuments, museums, and public commemorations as primary sources, his current research will answer the following questions. How are empires, number one, how empires were represented in the pub, how are empires represented in the public spheres, monuments, museums, archives, exhibitions, and the media in Australia and the Philippines? Number two, how and in what ways have these public memory sites become tools for challenging pro-colonial narratives and asserting indigenous and subaltern memories? And, part, and number three, what are the convergences and divergences in the recent efforts of the Philippines and Australia in terms of memorializing empires? Uh, I'm going to give the floor to our speaker now. Uh, thank you, Erica. I could just share my um, PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land and which we're meeting today. I pay respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So today, I am presenting uh, my PhD thesis proposal, which, which is still a work in progress until my confirmation in November. Um, the title of my presentation is Memorializing Empires in Asia Pacific, the Dutch East India Company, the Spanish Empire, and the Imagination of Colonial Past. Since I imagine this presentation as uh, or akin to my confirmation presentation, so I structured it um, as such. So I'll provide an overview of the um, project, my research questions, aims and scope, methodology, case studies, related literature, and I'll show you my uh, initial list of bibliography. <clears throat> Uh, this project, my thesis project, as mentioned a while ago, is part of an ARC linkage project called Mobilizing Dutch East India Company Collections for New Global Stories. The general aims of the project are as follows, to explore maritime history, particularly Dutch shipwrecks, art, and artifacts that lie beneath Australia's waters, and two, to examine Australia's place in global maritime history. Uh, my PhD dissertation will basically extend the discussion beyond Australia. Notably, it will connect public and scholarly debates around representations of European imperial expansion in Australia and neighboring Asian countries, in this case, the Philippines. So in this PhD uh, project um, hopes to broaden the reach and impact of this Australian conversation on um, uh, empires. So I'll begin. In 1815, 
after 250 years, the Manila Akapulco trade was abolished. The last ship to reach the Philippines was called Magallanes, named after the famed explorer. A century later, around 1989, mankind through NASA launched Magellan, a robotic spacecraft aimed at mapping the surface of the planet Venus. It was a fitting wow. name for a trailblazing mission that resulted in new discoveries about the planet Venus. The Gundam ship in 1815 and the space voyage in 1989 are just some of the many tributes to the lingering legacies of Fernando de Magallanes, a Portuguese explorer credited for the first circumnavigation of the globe in 1521. The naming of the spacecraft of different places and institutions to Manchela has been one of the most effective tools in commemorating the historic voyage. As early as the 16th century, for example, Magellan has been memorialized through various means such as monuments, stops, and naming of unexplained territories. One of the first world atlas published in 1570 used the term Magellanica or Magellanicum, meaning land of Magellan, to pertain to the hypothetical southern continent which figured prominently in different maps during the modern, the early modern period. Later explorations revealed that the hypothetical Magellanica or Terra Australis could have pertained to the present day Australia. The examples of memorialization of explorers I mentioned a while ago played a crucial role in colonial propaganda. The naming of territories, creation of monuments, and publication of stamps were used to propagate and celebrate the triumph of colonialism during this period. Although they uh, started as early as the 16th century, historian Eric Hobsbawm argues, argues that the widespread practice of designating statues uh, to commemorate events in material form was a cultural invention of the 19th century only. In, um, this is what historians call later on as memory boom, meaning a sudden surge in uh, memorialization and remembrances of historic events and personalities as manifested in the erection of different monuments, etc. Uh, today, according to historian David Blight, historiography is witnessing another wave of memory boom, a second memory boom especially with the development of public history as a distinct subdiscipline of history. The wave of anti-racist protests in the West and the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States triggered a new memory studies boom that seeks to reevaluate or reappraise our appreciation of memory sites, especially those that evoke dark or controversial past. These movements led to the toppling down of controversial monuments in the West. However, there was nothing distinctive with what is happening in the Western world. Uh, David Light, as I mentioned a while ago, called this scholarly trend in memory studies in the present as the second memory boom, to mean the development of scholarly research on memory and remembrances. The current trend does not only focus on the changing and evolving meanings of memory sites, such as monuments, plaza, and museum exhibits, but it extends to various state-sanctioned public commemorations of historic events. Now, we call this as historical stock-taking, and historical stock-taking has been sweeping across the globe, both in former imperial metropoles and colonies. One of the consequences of this reassessment is what we call as the re quote, return of the colonial past. Historian Robert R. Aldrich argues that the, quote, return of the ghost of the past, or colonial term in historiography, is brought about by unique political and social conjunctures to each country. However, he said one of his reasons why there is a re-examination of the colonial past has been the commemoration of anniversaries. State-sanctioned public anniversaries serve as political opportunities for historical reassessment of colonialism and its lingering legacies in the present. For example, in 2016, Australia commemorated Dirk Hartog's voyage um, aboard the ship, the Dutch ship and draft. Forty-four years later, in 2020, the Commonwealth government commemorated the 250th anniversary of James Cook's 
um, voyage aboard the ship Endeavour. Captain Cook was widely known as the quote, founding father of Australia, and his commemorative activities uh, sparked controversial debates um, regarding the continuing effects of settler colonialism in Australia. Several historians, for example, argued that the state sanctioned commemoration of Captain James Cook was, quote, slapped in the face of black fellas. A year later, in 2021, the world commemorated the quincentennial anniversary of Magellan circumnavigation. Commemorative activities were held in Europe, Latin America, and Southeast Asia. Stamps, monuments, conferences, and museums were greenlit to memorialize this historic event. These commemorations then turned historians' gaze once more into colonial history. So this memor memorialization and uh, uh, anniversaries served as an avenue for the, quote, resurrection of colonial history studies. So combine the two movements, you know, these two historiographical uh, trends bring us back to a familiar terrain, memory studies of the colonial past. The current research then lies at the intersection of these two developments in historiography. One, the current wave of memory boom, and two, a movement that brings us back to the historical reassessment of the colonial past. My thesis aims to compare and analyze the memory sites and public commemorations related to the Dutch East India Company, or the VOC in Australia, and the Spanish Empire in the Philippines. Moreover, it aims to analyze the function of these memory sites at different period and across various political, cultural, and social contexts and groups. I argue that across two distinctive, mm -hmm. across two distinctive colonial experiences and governance, similar patterns of resistance to and appropriation of this uh, Le Lieu de Memoir could be observed. Um, of course, the two countries differ in their colonial experiences. Australia is a settler colony, while the Philippines um, experience, in a way, um, a different type of colonialism. Um, they, they still have, uh, I'm sorry, their, their early national histories still reveal fascinating similarities or parallelisms. Um, for example, um, early contacts between Europeans and indigenous uh, be, uh, before the uh, before the start of colonialism um, is one example of that parallelism. Now, if you're going if we're going to look at the similarity of the development of um, historiography or the writing of history in between Australia and, and and the Philippines, both historiography of Australia and the Philippines developed roughly in the same manner. Uh, the Philippines and Australia initially they presented a uh, periodization of their history that is um, quite Eurocentric, Western centric. But different movements after the war, meaning the Second World War, um, resulted in a more progressive and more um, indigenous uh, or Filipino for the Philippines point of view uh, historiography. Now, although the way we present or the way they present this uh, history is more progressive in the present compared to uh, what it has been in the past, there are still uh, different memory sites, commemorations and museums dedicated to the colonial past. Uh, and and these this memory sites, they endure all throughout the nation, both in Australia and the Philippines. So this begs the question now, uh, in the way of a sweeping global reckoning of different memory sites, how do we deal with these controversial colonial memories and their material manifestation? Hence, a comparative analysis of these two experiences will reveal fascinating insights about the commemoration of empires, two different em empires, in a former colony, the Philippines, vis-a-vis -vis that of a settler colony, such as Australia. In comparing the memorialization of the past in Australia and the Philippines, I will employ the conceptual tools provided by uh, Pierre Nora's notion of Le Lieu de Memoir. I will extend this framework by connecting it with imperial history. Le Lieu de Memoir, or simply means memory sites, refer to any material or non-material object that acts as symbols of historical memory or remembrances, uh, meaning to say they act as containers of memory. 
in anchoring Nora's conceptual notions of memory sites to impair memory, I go beyond this initial unit of analysis. One limitation of Pierre Nora's Le Lieu de Memoir is that it's limited to the nation as unit of analysis. So in my uh, topic, in my thesis, I will try to go beyond the nation and will try to use this um, in, in a more transnational uh, approach. Um, I also borrow and follow the approach put forward by Gebhardt and Muller in their comprehensive work on imperial sites of memory. The following study in my PhD uh, dissertation will also show how the application of Nora's memory sites approach to imperial history provides new insights, empirical findings, and fresh reinterpretive shots. My project builds on the wide literature on the early national histories of both the Philippines and Australia. Uh, the, the, but the focus of the current research is the period from the 16th to the early 18th century, or the, or the early modern period. This period is characterized by the early national and pre-colonial histories of both Australia and the Philippines, where, uh, where European explorers were on their quest to search for new lands. I will particularly focus on the Spanish voyages to the Philippines from 1521 to 1815, and the Dutch voyages to Australia from 1606 to 1756. That's why in my slides, you can see a lot of um, um, scale model of different Dutch fleets you know, that I would use as primary sources in, in analyzing how that particular period is represented in these memory sites. Although this study will focus on how memory sites have evolved over time and how different groups memorialize empires, other perspectives um, that will go beyond uh, uh, other perspectives um, go, go beyond the scope of, the, of, of this research and therefore I won't be able to tackle them, such as, for example, uh, gender as, as a lens of uh, analysis. It's interesting that in future research, we see how, for example, the gender gap between those who are memorialized in monuments exhibited in, in, in museums um, will be shown. Huh? So um, based on the uh, literature that I read, I, I, summarized, uh, I summarized the current state of debates on memorialization. And these are the things that uh, emerge, meaning to say, um, um, I, I look at these things, no, and these are the, the dominant uh, discussion on memorialization. So different literature talks about exclusions in memory sites, representations perhaps of the indigenous voice, and the uh, pre-colonial history, silencing of histories in different memorial sites, and how memorial sites are used as a tool to challenge pro-colonial narratives, and conversely, how me uh, these memory sites are also used to, um, to, to propagate pro-colonial narratives, and um, how memory sites are used to present counter memories. Uh, on the other hand, uh, these are the gaps in literature that I uh, notice no um, as of now. Uh, the current literature on memorialization mostly focuses on European experiences and former imperial metropoles. Little has been written on the experiences of uh, former imperial uh, colonies or, or periphery. There's a wide literature on memorialization, uh, on memorialization of the two world wars, the first and the second world war. Manaming na isusulat siya. Um, again, there's a lack of focus on the Philippine colonial experience on memorialization. And although there's an attempt to provide a comparative analysis in some European countries, um, no, no, no comparative analysis has been written about uh, countries or between countries in Asia Pacific. And this is what I'm trying to, to fill in. Um, these are the objectives that I have identified as of now. Um, the, um, my, my PhD thesis aims to deepen our understanding of how the colonized and indigenous peoples uh, memorialize, represent, and challenge the legacies of the colonial empires in their homeland using memory sites and public commemorations. Um, number two, the project aims to track the evolving roles of these memory sites in forging national identities, identities and public attitudes towards the, toward the imperial past. As what Alan Gordon, historian, argues, for example, that these memory sites 
such as monuments, are physical manifestation or expression of contemporary values and historiography. So when historiography evolves, our appreciation of these memory sites and the way we view them also, also evolve. So that's what I'm going to uh, uh, try to show in this particular research. And these are my sub-research questions. Uh, I mentioned a while ago, how are empires and its colonial past represented in different memory sites, museums and public commemorations in Australia and the Philippines? How and in what ways have these public memory sites become tools for challenging pro-colonial narratives and, as, and asserting indigenous and subaltern memories? What is included and excluded in the overall narrative and commemoration of, this, uh, of the empire through these memory sites? What are the convergences and divergences in the recent efforts of the Philippines and Australia in terms of memorializing empire? This project will utilize artifacts, museum exhibits, monuments, um, and archival documents to situate the evolving representation of the empires over time. Museums and their collections will serve as primary sources in this research project. This research project, as I mentioned a while ago, uh, you, uh, is inspired by the seminal work of Pierre Nora and his conceptualization of Plebeid and Wong. Uh, this project will use historical methodology and criticism in evaluating and analyzing monuments, museums, and public commemorations as historiographical accounts. I divide my, uh, as, of, as of now, I divide my project into four themes. Number one, early national histories. Will provide a, uh, will will provide an overview of the uh, early national histories of both Australia and the Philippines, and the current debate on the early national history. Uh, the second theme is monuments. The third theme is um, museum exhibits, and the, the the last theme is public commemorations. So these things will hopefully provide a, co a comprehensive understanding of the evolving and ever changing attitude towards the remembrances of the colonial past. Uh, to thresh out the current issues and debates surrounding the themes enumerated, I plan to present a case study of six memory sites, two plazas, two museums, and two public commemorations. Uh, there will be one representative case study each, uh, each theme from the Philippines and Australia. For, memor uh, for Memorial Plaza, I plan to study and compare Plaza Ibero-Americano in Sydney, New South Wales, Australia, and Plaza Independencia in Cebu City, the Philippines. The Plaza Ibero-Americano, this one, um, was a bicentennial project first conceived in 1986. It aims to commemorate different Hispano-Lusitania historical figures and their contribution to historic uh, Australian history. Uh, like, for example, Pedro Fernandez, Fernandez de Quiros, who, um, um, who uh, explored the northern part of Australia, particularly the Cape York area. And Luis Baez de Torres, who, went, uh, um, uh, who, who explored the northern part of Australia too. No? And sa kanya pinahala yung Torres Strait. Um, the, the, the plaza is, compo, uh, is consists of two statues and 11 busts. One of the busts in, in, one of the, busts in the Plaza Ibero-Americano is dedicated to the Philippine national hero, um, Jose Rizal. Uh, meanwhile, on the other hand, uh, for the Philippines, I uh, will look at Plaza Independencia, uh, which is located in the historic Cebu City. The city, Cebu, is one, of, uh, is one of the oldest cities in the Philippines and had been the site of uh, numerous early encounters between European explorers and the natives in the 16th century. The plaza is just a few meters away from the Magellan Cross, a memorial site dedicated to the arrival of Magellan to the Philippines in 1521. The Plaza Independencia, unlike the Plaza Ibero, Plaza Ibero Americano, was a colonial is a colonial era plaza. In the 17th century, it was known as the Plaza de Armas or Plaza Mayor. And in the twilight years of the Spanish period, it was renamed as Plaza Maria Cristina in honor of Ma uh, Queen Maria Cristina. Meanwhile, during the American colonial period, the plaza was renamed as Plaza Libertad. 
the change of its name over time also reflects its rich history and significance to the community. The plaza features a statue of Antonio Pigafetta and uh, President Ramon Magsay site. There's also an obelisk uh, dedicated for Miguel Lopez de Legazpi. Yeah. Included in, in the complex uh, is a, was a Spanish era fortress called Fuerza de San Pedro, uh, Fort San Pedro. So these two uh, case studies, uh, will, um, I will I will try to illustrate and, exa and, and, and examine the function of these two memorial sites at different times and across different social uh, groups. Both plazas feature important commemorative statues dedicated to the prominent figures in the early national histories of each respective countries. Um, for museums, I plan to explore Western Australia's Shipwreck Museum in Perth, uh, and the Museum of Philippine Maritime History in Iloilo. So in hindsight, both museums are dedicated to the early national histories of Australia and the Philippines pertaining to the uh, exploration voyages in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. The Museum, the Shipwreck Museum in Western Australia is responsible for managing all historic shipwrecks and relics in Western Australia. I will specifically look at their shipwreck collection of the different Dutch voyages to Australia from the 16th to 18th century. I will explore the, uh, the presentation of various shipwrecks with regards to the early national history of Australia. Meanwhile, uh, for the Philippines, I will study the uh, Museum of Philippine Maritime History. Um, it, it is the sole uh, museum in the Philippines that focuses uh, on the maritime history of the Philippines from pre-colonial up to the present. It opened last January 14, 2023, and is housed in the refurbished old Aduana or Customs House uh, in Iloilo City. The museum has six galleries narrating the rich maritime history of the Philippines. Out of the six galleries, three are dedicated to the maritime history during the colonial period. The museum, just like the Shipwreck Museum of Australia, houses relics, replica, and, and, and scale model ships of the galleons, uh, uh, the galleon ships during the Spanish period. Both uh, museums feature narratives and primary sources in the early national histories of the Philippines and Australia, especially pertaining to the voyages uh, from the 16th to 18th century. For the public commemorations, I plan to study the 400-year commemorations of Dirk Hartog in 2016 and the 500-year commemorations of Ferdinand Magellan in 2021. The year 2016 marks the 400-year anniversary of Dirk Hartog's landing in West Australian coast. This is an historic event because Hartog left the very first physical evidence of European arrival in Australia, a pewter dish. The commemoration was supported by the governments of Australia and the Netherlands. Various commemorative activities were held all over Australia. A replica of the Dutch ship Duif Ken uh, also graced the commemoration at Shark Bay. Australian museums joined the commemoration. Uh, and different educational reference sites and materials were also produced to, uh, to, were produced to commemorate the historic event in the early national history of Australia. Meanwhile, uh, for the Philippines, the 20, I will look at the 2021 Quincentennial Commemorations uh, with the theme Victory in Humanity. Uh, this uh, Quincentennial Commemorations mark three important historic events in the early colonial history of the Philippines and the history of the world. Number one, the introduction of Christianity in the Philippines. Number two, circumnavigation of the world. And number three, the victory of uh, the Battle of Mactan. So uh, this is the, the, my, my current timeline. So um, so I'll, I'll actually have my confirmation in November. So by um, January, uh, I'll start with my uh, field work in the Philippines. Then I'll return uh, in Australia by June to start my field work in West Australia and look at the museums in, in, in uh, West Australia and different um, memorial sites, uh, the, the, the memorial site I mentioned in Cebu. Uh, and these are, my, these are the, um, the, the, the uh, literature that I'm currently using. So 
So, yun lamang po sa ngayon. Maraming salamat. And good afternoon. Thank you so much, Donnie. Um, I know we have a question, I think, from Ethel there. Um, but I think we can uh, yes. for now. Uh, questions for Donnie for our Q and A later. Um, if and but if anyone has other questions for Donnie, uh, please feel free to use the chat function, and then we'll get back to you later. Um, okay, so let's move to our second speaker for today. Uh, Arvind Jake Adobo is an MPhil candidate in Geography and Anthropology at the University of Melbourne. He obtained his BSc in uh, Geography at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. So his talk, Living with Waste, Emotion, Value, and Power in Philippine Waste Picking, argues that waste picking is not just mere struggle nor subsistence. It is an act of living filled with agency and humanity. His study will adopt uh, the concept of power, value, and emotion as entry points building upon one another, not only to form a multidimensional narrative, but to challenge the reductive tendency of scholarship to compartmentalize the waste victim story. Uh, Arvin, you have the floor. Okay. All right, so hello, everyone. I am Arvin Jake Adobo again, for those who don't know me yet. And uh, I've been presenting, my research is entitled Living with Race, Emotion, Value, and Power in Filipino Waste Picking. But before anything else, I would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the unceded lands and work study and pay my respect uh, to the others past, present, and emerging. So before anything else, in order to formally begin my presentation, I would like to pose this question, what is waste? And perhaps we try to reflect on this question, waste, you know, is idealized or like the image of waste that we have is that material that we throw away in the bed, that useless material that ends up in the landfill. But if we are going to review the literature, waste has gone beyond that material treatment. It is, you know, our uh, a common common conception of waste is that it's a problem, it's a solution. And so that's why we have waste management in the first place, because it is a problem, it is connected to uh, global warming and climate change. But beyond that, uh, waste is considered to be, in the words of John Crow, uh, zero degree of value. It means it's useless. That's why we threw it away in the first place, because it has no value anymore. And uh, for Mary Douglas, and connected to you know the theory of third uh, waste is a matter out of place. And to say matter of, out of place, it means that waste is connected to a particular type of order. It means that there is a place, and anything outside that place is dirt. It's waste. And so I think that it's important to discuss waste in connection to order, in connection to order, and then waste is waste is disruptive, waste is connected to uh, colonialism, it has colonial legacy. Waste is archived. Uh, to look at waste, we are able to look at how a particular society also works. Waste is pollution, waste is part of the site, waste is a class instrument. It means that when you're wasteful, it means you have enough resources, you have something to waste in the first place. And so um, to be wasteful means you have a privilege. And so it's a class instrument. It's to be wasteful means uh, you have resources in the first place. And even in late capital in a late capitalist world, corporations uh, want to be wasteful in order to show to uh, investors, for example, that we are willing to undergo drastic change in order to you know uh, get a lot of investment. So being wasteful in the late capitalist world is also being creative with political, and this can go on and on and on. That indeed garbage has to be the point of our day of our time. Well, waste has become this tangled conceptual vector by which different scholars, you know, have underpinned different theorizations on what weight is. Uh, it has uh, someone, uh, own field of its own that we call discourse studies. And so waste has almost overcome its materiality. It has moved beyond the literal. But there is a life that's closely tied to waste, and that is the life of our waste breakers. But if waste is the point, what then is waste picking? If waste has gone beyond its literal meaning, what then is waste picking scholarship? Let's review the literature. So if we're going to look at the, the, the literature, I think that waste picking scholarship has not moved beyond the literality or li the materiality of waste. Like there is this monolithic discourse going on and what waste picking is, that waste pickers are framed as marginalized and pressed, they live in Abject poverty, poor working conditions, uh, 
and they are people overpowered by the system. And aside from that, as scholars, you know, frame uh, wave pickers as marginalized and oppressed, uh, they also summon you know, the, their contributions to the waste management system that they have, that they consider to be the backbone of zero waste, that they contribute to the circularity of the economy. <clears throat> and so given their marginality and oppression, given their contributions to the waste management sector, scholars often point to configuration supermality in order to you know, integrate the waste picking sector to the formal waste management system. But in this kind of literature, I hear you know, some discontent. Why? Because the way uh, marginality and oppression is you know, always tackled in this literature as if that's all there is in the waste picking story, as if you know, like waste picker are passive subjects in the landfill waiting for a savior to come, and they're just waiting for a form of Mithaya to save them from their deplorable condition. And this is not to discount, you know, the realities, the material realities of marginality and oppression. These are lived experiences. But exactly, these are lived experiences. And so there is some, it is necessary to highlight, you know, the agency and capability of those figures. So this is not just a monologue by which structural oppression happened, and that's it. And we need, and the waste picking sector needs intervention in order to save them from their condition. Uh, it needs a more dynamic story that highlights them as human beings, embodying individuals, experiencing all this, and you know, as people capable, as someone who is living, as human. And secondly, uh, in terms of their contribution to the waste management sector, I think that there is also a tendency to privilege the material over the human in storing the, you know, the waste management system. Like, we are only tackling, or like we also want to intervene and help help the waste picking sector in a way because we want waste to be managed well. It's like we essentialize them in terms of transaction that, you know, we essentialize them in their role in managing waste. And as so that's all there is, like there is discontent in the current model of the circular economy and how it has privileged the material. And what about the human face of that material? We are so concerned with reuse, reduce, recycle, and that's it. Like, what about the conditions of waste pickers? And it's like, I mean, I'm not saying that we should privilege the human over the material, but at the very least, um, I think that it's problematic in a way to, you know, to story the lives of waste pickers as if it's just a side thing, as if it's the periphery of the waste management story. And lastly, for the formalization strategy, I think that these terms, formality, informality, uh, given that according to Medina, uh, waste, the waste picking sector epitomizes the informal sector. So these terms are these terms are always summoned like formality, informality. But I think that there's a need to at least problematize and explore what this formality really means. What does informality really mean? I mean, it's not I I mean it's not to say that we should uh, settle what is formality and informality in the first place. But I think that there is a need to at least explore what these really mean because you know formality and informality have implications on the ground. These are just words we use so much in our scholarship. We can just operate into a particular definition for one paper without really exploring that there is a debate going on in what formality and informality in this particular sector. And so I think that must be explored at the very least or accepted. Fortunately, uh, there are scholars recognizing, you know, that there is monolithic narrative going on, and so th these scholars um have recognized that there is indeed a need to go beyond that narrative to highlight the agency and creativity without necessarily romanticizing the lives of face pickers. And I point to the words of George Reno, Cindy Mary Brightron, Catherine Miller. Now your trash is on the stretcher, available life, reclaiming the discarded, and there have been. Many other studies as well, like beyond this, but I particularly adored this ethnography of these anthropologists because they story the lives of waste pickers without really ignoring that structural oppression is real and without ignoring it in that story that it make it also makes up the waste picking story. But the problem is, I mean, my just upon reflecting on their work, I realized that there is also a tendency to story the lives of waste pickers as if we Waste is something that happens in the background, as if you know, like waste is just the backdrop, the canvas by which life blossoms. And I think that the waste picking story must also carry waste with it. 
side by side with it. And it's not just a material, a class of material that's dead, that way speakers use to articulate the good life in the, uh, in the words of the matter, but way of thinking and ways go side by side with each other. And it is in this regard that I'm asking following research questions, how do we speakers live with ways? And then I will be using and deploying the uh, uh, power, value, and emotion as entry points into their lives. And I think that to ask how do we speakers live with ways is strategic because it invites possibility. It means that way of thinking is a life in multiplicity. So it's not just mere subsistence, but it can be a part of it. Like it could be, it could be, but at least the research question would invite, would invite the different possibilities by which way speakers live with ways. And by using power, value, and emotion as entry points, we can highlight a multi-dimensional story, just like what uh, Erica said, that aside from multi-dimensionality, they uh, build up on one another and that they percolate in one another and waste picking is all of it all at once. And as much as waste has become a poem or like a million other things, like it could be waste is residue, it could be, it could imply human failure, it could be political and so on. Then waste pickers also have to tra also have to thread what it means and the consequence of engaging with waste. And given that we want to, you know, highlight that story, that multidimensional or like the story that does not necessarily fix waste picking as one thing or another, we need a conceptual framework that will be able to highlight or that dynamics. And it is uh, in this regard that I'm conceptualizing waste at phase, but I'm building up first and foremost to these three theorizations, waste as or waste as treasure, with material basis to articulate the good life. Because um, in these conceptual <clears throat> frameworks, as I reflect on the words from some waste fitting scholar, there is a tendency to also fix waste. And it also highlights how waste and waste fitting are so connected to each other that the re-theorization of one necessarily involves or affects how we theorize or how we frame the other. So for example, waste is or waste is a stressor. I think that it also fixes waste as the waste picking happens. And the like waste pickers just see waste as if it's a glittery material by which this has value and so something as if that's just all there is in waste picking, but waste can oppress too, like it can be oppressive. As much as waste pickers would say, would say that, well, this material, uh, this material helps me live. No, this material helps you to not live. It is suppressive to you and so on and so forth. So I think there, there is a need for a conceptual framework that does not also fix waste. And thirdly, formularize waste as material basis to articulate the good life. I think it, is dynamic in a way. And it speaks closely to me, but the problem is, again, this, just like what I said a while ago, there's a tendency to put ways in the background there, as if, you know, like life happens and just ways is there, back to material as ways because they're the life. So it's just a material basis, like a base base of any. And so I needed a conceptual framework that's, that will be able to highlight what we want the story about ways picking. And that is waste as space. So my my theorization of waste as space has three characteristics. One, waste acts as a container of activity. Two, waste is produced by these activities. And thirdly, waste shapes these activities. And this waste of space was um, influenced largely by my reading of Henry Lefebvre, conceptualizing space as produced. Like space isn't just where things happen. We produce space like as much this room is here. As we go in here, we produce space, but this is this type of space. And yeah, like space is not just inner, it's always unstable, it's dialectical. So for one, waste acts as container of activities. And I say this because you know, like if there's no waste, uh, uh waste pickers wouldn't have happened, like waste picking wouldn't have happened, and there's no waste, the government or uh, waste managers wouldn't have said that uh we must manage waste. And so Given that waste pickers say that it could be a means of subsistence, and the government can say that no, it's waste is a problem. And so they interact in ways as if waste is a space. So if we take away waste, uh, these phenomena, these phenomena wouldn't have happened in the first place. And so I think of waste as a container of activity. But these characteristics are simultaneous. Second, waste is produced by these activities. So as activities happen, like uh, waste pickers pick waste, they produce waste. Waste as in that material where they could, you know, that could be a basis of living, but 
uh, for example, the government or society must say that waste is a problem. So they produce waste, like waste is a problem, waste is a means of living, but what is waste? And so in a way, waste is always unstable because it's a tug of war, like it's a space that always the electrical and unstable, it changes every time. And so like waste pickers would say that no, waste this, government would say no, waste this, we produce waste. And thirdly, uh, that's why I found the other inadequate because they tend to forget the materiality of waste. The third one is important, waste shapes these activities. And so it's not as if the human is not saying what waste should be, but even waste participates in its, in its production. Like we could shape how activities pan out. Like it's the, it's the stench, it's the dirt, it's the history of waste that shapes how you know the discussion goes on like the government would say that it's a problem waste is a problem and that's because of the materiality of waste like waste is toxic and secondly uh waste pickers would say that um waste no waste is waste is something that can have value and that's because of the very materiality of waste like because of waste itself so as much as this activity, these activities produce waste dialectically we also, in turn, participate in the discussion that no, this is just, this is how the discussion should go because of my properties, because of my materiality. And as much as it is a conceptual frame, it is also a reality. And just like the production of spaces, you know, it tends to abstract, to make my pieces abstract in a way like, it's what you're just, it's a way like, in a way that like you're like theorizing ways only, how is how does this conceptual framework have bearings in reality? But in a way, like that's why I also appeal to it was appealing to me to borrow the fab because the fab also similarly had that kind of discontent on how on how we have produced a lot of space. Like we there's a there's a mental space with the epistemological space, like the space, the mental space, like the I think of space, the legion space, and so on and so forth. Then we have urban spaces, shopping spaces, spaces molded by urban planners. So um, in a way, Nafab said that we have created a lot of spaces, but what there are gaps in between. How do all these spaces connect all at once? And so Nafab wanted to take reality with it. And as much as this theory is very abstract, it also has very in reality, but just lose reality in the discussion. So that's why uh, it appealed to me to use, to espouse, and to adopt LAPAB in conceptualizing waste of space as in order to not forget that this isn't just a theory, but it also needs to get to have bearings on the ground. And so, yeah, uh, it is also it's recorded that I'm choosing the case of Puerto Princesa Palawan because if we're going to read the literature, most of the time, international scholars, so like international comparison, would take Metro Manila as the main case of waste pickers, as if, you know, it, as if it is the Philippine condition when it might not be. And so, I took, I take Puerto Princess of Palawan as a case in order to be centered from Imperial Manila. The Philippines is made up of 7, 000, more than 7,000 islands with different stories, and the Manila condition, the Metro Manila condition, might not necessarily reflect. The conditions of other islands in the Philippines. And secondly, uh, Puerto Princesa also straddles with it multiple imaginaries like the last ecological frontier, uh, eco a popular eco tourist destination, eco tourist destination here in the country. And so it's, inter it's interesting that as someone coming from the province, like a lot of islands in the Philippines also, also uh, straddle that kind of imaginary, the tourism imaginary. And so it's interesting, I mean, not to you know, but, I mean, that fetishize it, but it's interesting to, you know, to see how ways connect with the tourism and imaginary and the pristine image of the islands. And lastly, local waste regimes and extra governmental programs. So in here, we can see a lot of waste issues going on in Puerto Princesa. Like recently, uh, over 1,000 trash bins of garbage collected in Puerto Princesa base clean up of that. So there was a competition where people Pick, pick plastic bottles they raise to pick up the big plastic bottles to fill their sacks and and whoever has the a lot of sacks filled or like the weight will win and um, um green groups also uh lobbied against uh waste to energy project in Puerto Princesa and BNR shuts down all 
opened themselves nationwide. This was during the latest time, but there was a recent news that it was misrepresented. And so why? Why should we represent? So why should we misrepresent the story that you have closed up in both sides? So that's also a point of inquiry, like why must you misrepresent us? If, like, is it part of this human cravings, totalized control over waste, given that waste is very, you know, it is very resistant and so on. And lastly, uh, the USA had a project there, like, until now, they're still connected with uh, that project, like Project Zacchaeus here, Project Zacchaeus. And I think that most, what uh, also captured, like, captured my attention is this, this part here, like in Puerto Princesa, USA Assistant Administrator Michael Shea, I don't know how to pronounce that, turned over collection vehicles and a set of uniforms to the eco warriors to help professionalize their image. And why me professionalize? So, what interesting, I mean, uh, points of inquiry. So, I guess there's that. I end my presentation here. So, welcome, suggestions. And so, thank you very much, Arvid, Kate. We have plenty of and I think since um that goes through question uh during Don Week's talk, uh, I know we can start with this. Ay, nasagot na, Erica. <laughs> nasagot na, Erica. Although, generally, generally speaking, you mentioned three um sites of um uh so yung plaza, yung museum, and uh what was the third one? Public commemorations. Yeah. Uh yeah. So, but aside from, so I know those are your case study sites, but aside from those, what are the other, other um, sites you are considering? Uh, um, number one, one, one site that I initially considered was uh, Intramuros. Um, Intramuros is, well, uh, Intramuros is a very good site to show um how we commemorate the Spanish Empire. But then again, um, the, um, the intra Intramuros um, shows a robust, um, robust um, anti-colonial narrative in our remembrance of the, the past. And current literature on Intramuros and how Intramuros shows anti-colonial narrative. I'm sorry, the literature um, generalizes that the Philippines has a robust anti-colonial um, memorialization. And, um, and, and I chose that particular memory site and I, I chose to, uh, to, to, to leave Intramuros first and go to Cebu in order to show in my thesis that just like Jay, there are multiple um, memorialization of different groups and 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 the anti the, the, the supposed robust anti colonial stance of the Philippines with regards to memorializing the past is not really a general experience. Most well in Intramuros, yes, but yeah, looking at the site uh, I mentioned a while ago, Cebu. Um, they, they feature uh, a lot of pro-colonial narratives there. Like the, um, in, in 2021, the statue of Pigapeta in Plaza Independencia was refurbished uh, in time for the commemoration of the uh, Magellan voyage. So yeah, I, I, I chose that um, because it, it, it focuses on the voyages, the early national history, and it might reveal a different story other than the one um, uh, being shown through Intramuros. But yeah, I considered Intramuros. And definitely I will try to I will try to provide a brief background. Uh, I imagine my thesis to provide a brief background and current debates on on that particular memory site, Intramuros. 
Yeah. But for museums, uh, for museums, I I think for for the museum, since I I am part of the Dutch uh the the, the ARC Vintage Project, I am fairly limited to the West Australian Shipwreck Museum since um that the, the point of the project is to really use the 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 shipwreck mm -hmm. um that they discovered and are stored in Western Australian uh, Museum. And since I am looking at the early national history, the voyages and the shipwreck, I also need to look for a counterpart of um, a museum in the Philippines. And luckily, NHCP just opened its um, Maritime Museum, our, the first Maritime Museum in, in uh, the, the Philippines in Iloilo. So those two might provide good examples of how we uh, present and memorialize that particular period in the histories of the two nations. And I think si Ma'am Eta focuses on museums. So, yeah. Yeah. so <laughs> but I love it. She love can be one of your informants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then public commemoration, I chose yung dalawa, yung 2021, kasi ito napakalaki nung nilakas na pera din ng government. And, um, and you know the commemoration marami siya marami ka pwedeng i-is out you can be uh, the, with that commemoration because again there's a general view that we have a robust anti-colonial memorialization mm -hmm. but then um there are the, the, the NQC the National Centennial Commemoration in the Philippines i think is um it, well it, it the, the events um <laughs> It's it's quite there are lots of irony in, in that particular yeah. that I need to that I feel like um my, my thesis would would crash out mm -hmm. and and controversies also uh regarding that um regarding that uh particular commemoration and and for Australia uh they're hard called because again I am focusing on the Dutch um collections that's why. The, the nearest commemoration, state sanctioned commemoration, um, was their cartels in 2016, 400 years. Again, that commemoration is also ironic because, as I've said a while ago, um, some historians argued that these commemorations are slap in the face of La Pelas and yeah. the indigenous because why pour money into mm. commemorating these legacies instead of, you know, uh, centering or foregrounding the voices of the indigenous peoples. So th that's how I came up with this. And and hopefully my supervisors will will, uh, will approve of them. <laughs> so yeah. Hey, follow up question lang. Kasi ang ganda ng topic mo, kaya lang ang worry ko is parang ang dami mong case studies, tatlong sites. Are you required, are you required by the project to have all three sites or instead focus on one case study and have a deeper kind of um exploration of the the you know from an institutional so if you're looking at for example the museum or the um or the the um the plazas it's from uh memorialization is from an institutional point of view diba kasi it's either the government or if it's the museum's point of view um well and a NHCP, a gobierno. But I'm curious to find out how does that memorialization impact the way ordinary citizens see and view colonization from an everyday point of view? May impact ba siya or, or is that outside the purview of the research? The second right. one also is yung Ang ganda nung point mo na like you you didn't include intramuros because in the Philippines there's a very strong anti-colonial sentiment in you know in a lot of his historic sites and I think that that is an aspect na maganda ring i i uh, um i unfold in your research yun lang yeah thank you uh for the first question. I think that's part of what I I would like to include it. Uh, I would like to look at explore in my research how these memory sites again 
um, mo, um, um, going, I, I try to go beyond uh, Pierre Nora's uh, idea of memory site because Pierre Nora's idea of memory site is that these memory sites are containers of um, history, containers of the past, um, particularly state-sanctioned interpretation of history. So in my field work, I would like to, uh, to, to, to tease out how ordinary citizens uh, view and appreciate these memorial sites because there's a possibility that within the, 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 the narrative, the grand uh, the, the narrative propagated by the national government, for example, or the institution, um, the, the, there are multiple counter memories or counter narratives that, that might, you know, um, that, that might, um, that, that I can thresh out of this uh, memory sites. One perfect example, one perfect example of this is also Intramuros. And I think I can look at that as a model. Um, in Intramuros, uh, as I said, there's a strong anti-colonial narrative since uh, Intramuros centers foregrounds the sacrifices made by Rizal, um, etc. But then again, um, in, in that quote official narrative, um, there are multiple voices also missing in, in that narrative. Like for example, um, there are no memory sites inside Intramuros initially um, dedicated to other minorities in the Philippines, such as Chinese. Later on, a group of Chinese would uh, would would institutional would, would would create their own museum in Bahai Chino that would um, present their own um, in a way perspective of the 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 Philippine history that is not sanctioned by the official Intramuros administration, but later of course they were closely with. With that, so I think that's also a good model in trying to thresh out how these um, memory sites, would, uh, how ordinary citizens or other uh, groups appreciate uh, these memory sites and how they, they in a way, um, would use these memory sites to stop their memories, stop their um, histories. So yeah, I would try to look at that. Too. Thank you. Usap tayo, o dami ko tanong. <laughs> yes. Sige, let's have it then. Yeah, yeah. Sige. Uh, first, congratulations to Dendi and uh, our very fascinating projects. Uh, conceptually provocative and I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure when you finish data gathering, you would really generate a lot of interesting empirical insights. So, some questions siguro and comments for both. Inayin ko na kay Arvin para uh, <clears throat> I really like how you problematize the different, you know, discourses around ways and uh, particularly uh, your focus on formalization is really problematic. Like who defines what is formal and informal? Who defines what is, what, what is ways? And in this context, when you were trying to understand the lives or the lived experiences of way speakers themselves. Maybe it's also important to look at how, in many ways, they are also treated as ways themselves. You know, culturally, institutionally, legally, spatially speaking. Uh, and that's why they are, in the larger scheme of things, considered informal workers in, in the Philippines. When you try to probably problematize how they live with ways, maybe it's important to understand their way speaking routines, not just the power asymmetries. Because mm -hmm. eh, once mm -hmm. you, uh, especially you're looking at Palawan, so mm -hmm. there would be a lot of indigenous practices and uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know insights with respect to way speaking cultures mm -hmm. and whether these are related to their valuation of the environment. Because the Palawanians, they are known to be very environment friendly, but how is it linked to their idea of way speaking? Is it in relation to the protection of the environment or to the economic and material dimensions of, of waste? Uh, and then I think I also have a bullet point here on framing waste as space is produced by activities, but also by structures, the larger structures, because you were uh, mm -hmm. emphasizing the importance of the larger social structures. 
yon kay kay Dondi, I, I really like how you also you know look at three in a way thematic focus the plaza the museum and the public commemorate commemoration so the, very deliberate tone no? because they have different audiences for instance museum would have different visitors plazas would generate different public reactions so i was wondering whether you would also be documenting and analyzing the reactions the responses of these different audiences and how they relate to or how they make sense of the images the memories created generated by what's available in a particular plaza museum that's one second uh, are you going to foreground the role of the catholic church in the philippines in you know trying to for instance more uh, remember the 500 years of christianity in, in the philippines i said they are an important stakeholder in in a way returning to that kind of glorification of the spanish colonization but also christian introduction in the philippines or for that matter catholic catholicism then since this is also for your uh Yeah, for your seminar, maybe the last slides would be the challenges ahead okay, that you're you're in a way anticipating at this point, para makita ng committee members mo that you you really understood the different dynamics. Because uh, I partly I share Ethel's concern that you might have too uh, too many cases or different dimensions. I think one of the Two of them can be part of your postdoc. <laughs> but but you know, it's, it's, it's always easier to narrow down. Otherwise, they're very, very fascinating. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I've also thought of it as if we speakers are also treated as we. That's why, upon you know conceptualizing my chapter outline, I think that. In the last part, I will be forwarding that concept that of embodied, embodied materiality. Also, the, although the term was used differently in by scholars like embodied materiality, but I concept I think of embodied materiality as materials arriving in corporeal form. Like it has uh, like materials are now embodied; they become ways itself. But I also am trying to to think of it much more because because I think it can be problematic to think. To essentialize waste pickers as waste. So, so I think I want to explore for further about this, like to think it through if this is the right way. To... Yeah, so maybe some field I will get much more information. And of course, some comments about, yeah, definitely. That's why I, I, I found the waste of space very convenient because there can be a lot of narratives going on, like even rules and guidelines, like the law can shape waste, it's uh, waste as space yeah. itself. So, it's not just the structures, it's not just the disabilities, but a lot of things can shape space, I waste as space. And that's why, yeah, I found ways as space to be, because in the field, if ever something comes up, like you can thinking of it now, spirit, but in the field itself, a lot of things can come up. And so uh, waste space can be really convenient to you know, house that all of this is part of the narrative. So, Okay, so for first point, yeah, I would uh, uh look at the um audiences of this and how they relate to these uh, memory sites and their reaction to this memory sites and how they appreciate this memory site. So I think um that that's a good that's a good uh, thing to do because it will foreground different uh multiple multiple publics multiple multiple groups appreciation and attitude towards that particular um, paths. So yeah, so for the second one uh, regarding the foregrounding of the role of the Catholic Church, um, the definitely I would look at that uh, since um, the 2021 uh, the 2021 public commemorations um, involved, uh, involved the, the Catholic Church. They also had their own uh, theme for that particular year and they had a year-long celebration, also celebration of, of the arrival of the 
Christian in the Philippines. So yeah, I would I would um I would also include them in the discussion. And uh, right um while I was listening to your comments, yeah, I realized there's menjo madami ng anin, but um I'll have a meeting with my supervisor <laughs> <laughs> because initially, because initially uh, it was oh, them who actually uh, suggested dividing my my topic into or the, the, the theme of my topic into three uh, and then um, identifying case studies um, between the two but yeah I'll raise that I'll raise that once mm -hmm. yeah we we'll just try to focus on uh, reserve perhaps. some themes for your post though. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so then, thank you thank you um, Thank you for the both of you for, for the gift of such exciting uh, research projects to, to talk about this evening. So uh, I have a question for, for both. Um, so I, I would ask um, Arvin first. Um, two questions, one more per se, like formalistic relating to the, the thesis of the genre of writing, and the other more methodological or, or orientational, if you like. So um, the first one relates to your research question. I just want to, to, to pick your brain some more about what your disciplinary question is, what your geography question is. I understand you are intervening in, you know, in the notion of space. Um, but I, I, a few things that have come out to me as someone who has had also training, in, some training in political science, you know, the, the, the notion of power mm -hmm. is also central to the study of politics. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just wanted you to talk some more about what the geography question there is. Uh, you know, it's something that you might want to consider um, um, teasing out some more for an audience of mm -hmm. geographers, because, you know, who am I? I'm not a geographer. So I, I may have missed a geography theme there, because it is something that we are expected to do. We're expected to 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 to, to convey our ideas to mm -hmm. a generalist audience and also to 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 talk to a field of specialists as well. So that's some uh, one of the expectations of the thesis. And um my second question to you would be um are you using other scholars aside from Uncle Latab about you know the the notion of space, but um, I, I've noticed, you know, you, you've had the decentering gesture mm -hmm. in your thesis, like, you, you know, um, distancing away from Imperial Manila and looking at Puerto Princesa, but uh, there is also a, a, a danger in, in rehearsing the club, mm -hmm. as, you know, that is Eurocentricity, uh, you know, or any dead white French men <laughs> in particular. So, uh, and, and considering that so many people have theorized space mm -hmm. um, in the global south. So those two main points. And uh, for Dondi, thank you. Uh, also exciting uh, because you know, this, this maritime nerd is also uh, <laughs> very much excited with what your, what, what your project will turn out to be. So um, perhaps my question would be how, and this is a phrase that has come up like a few times in your presentation, the imperial past. How do you approach the imperial past? Do you have a particular moment in which, in, in your story, in which time ceases to be the imperial past? Yeah. So does the notion of Le 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 Noir help you in this? Yeah. I think, uh, <laughs> so, uh, okay. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely like very valid questions and points. Like upon conversing my research with my supervisors, uh like uh giving him my draft, that's one of the comments that uh for forefront pointed out that although my I am under a very multidisciplinary committee, like an anthropologist and a human geographer who's also leaning towards ethnography or like anthropology as well. So yeah, um, as I was submitting my graph, he always says na, always go back as well, like where is geography in all this? Like, yeah, like don't just focus on imperial culture. Like, 
yeah, but also include geography in the discussion. And I think the geography inserts, given that geography is, you know, like a lot of students would also say that they are present everywhere. I think the geography yeah. is also present in the field and it would manifold. But in, their, in terms of the research questions here, I think they're also very, very valid comments as well. I must bear where geography is in the research question. But in terms of the field itself, I think that, if, for example, upon value, like value transformation, a lot of scholars tend to explore value as if it's floating, as if it changes. But value is anchored in space. And so there is a necessity to, I think it must be explored like how value transforms from the dump site and then to the jump shot and then to The first sentence of your <laughs> oh, yeah. And then to space, definitely like, yeah, it's also very valid that I'm just using one concept. But I think I think that what appealed to me in Lafab's concept is that I think Lafab was the only one, I mean the proponent of that theory that space is produced. And I was I just want to use that one, but I think that, yeah, I think in terms of the thesis itself, there's a need to also bear that spaces produced can have problematic concepts in it. Like it has, it also has gaps in order to unsettle also that, in order to not make it a monolithic discourse as if, mm -hmm. you know, Lafab is very uh, right about this. Yeah. So, because I read Yikutwan, for example, a very good humanistic geographer conceptualizing on place and space but there's for the longest time to say i think that space has been conceptualized as inert like it's dead it's just a canvas it's just where things happen but lafab in i think this is his last book i don't know oh uh, yeah and for lafab he exploded all those codes all at once that space lafab was very averse of that idea that space has no power in itself, so it's just dead. So that's why he, as a humanist, as a someone influenced by Nietzsche and uh, Marx, he Lefebvre conceptualized space as produced to, yeah. yeah, to highlight the production, very Marxist product, space as produced as well as uh the humanistic part of it. So yeah, but I will read definitely in order to not it make uh as if Lefebvre was the be all and all of what space is. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, so that's a very good question actually. So it, it, I, I, I think I have been problematizing the, this, this particular questions, uh, this particular question since I started writing my document. That's why when, when, when usually when we write um, an article or a research project in history, there's a particular time frame, right? Yeah. But if you noticed in my presentation, I did not put any particular time frame because I think I am, I am still in the process of thinking about that. When, when does the imperial past uh, cease to be uh, the imperial past. So what one one thing I think that's why I think uh, my my one of my supervisors, no, um, she um, uh, suggested to actually include that first theme in my thesis to um, to to um, foreground the uh, or to at least um, uh, to to to, to uh, highlight that this project is still a history project that works with the particular timeline that part that particular uh, theme on, on early national history that I would I would try to look at how uh, the debate on national history 
uh, early national history, particularly that particular past, develops both in Australia and the Philippines. But I think one of the approach that I need to do also is to um to provide a distinction between history and memory and how history and memory intersects and how they, the, uh, a particular history becomes part of collective memory. And in that way, I think I would be able to put, um, in a way, a, a line, a fine line between when uh, an, the imperial past um, ceases to be a, an imperial past, but becomes part of a collective memory. So, yeah. A very brief panel. Uh, since you talk about you know, probably differentiating memory or history from memory and vice versa. But again, your pantai pananao, comrade, who is here, <laughs> from whose perspective are you going to analyze this? From whose history or memory are you going to frame some of the findings and empirical? Yeah, but, but um, but I I think uh, that is where uh, the um I I think um that is where I uh in a way diverge from um Pierre Nora. Uh, I just used the, the, his conceptual notions, but I will go beyond him because Pierre Nora's analysis focuses on the memory sites sanctioned by the state, meaning um there's already a distinct narrative there's already a distinct group from which perspective yeah yeah but but here in my research i would try to foreground multiple publics and multiple voices and appreciation of this uh of, of these memory sites that that's the problem that's one of the problem i think with pantayong pananaw eh. na, na, I don't buy it. So yeah, that's a very good question. I think that would very much help me in 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 my um. I would bring all these comments. Yeah, because, uh, you know, obviously international law has an international law answer to what I just asked you, but, you know, it, it's not about me at this point. I just wanted to hear from you how you would respond from it. Mm -hmm. And uh, is, it, is he also a dead French scholar? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, Ian has questions. I English. kung pasensya na kung medyo mga bobo tanong Pero mostly mga comments lang siya at responses. Ayan, echo yun, yun sa discussion kanina, actually. Coming from a performance studies um perspective naman. Interesting yung pag-bridge ng history and memory. Kasi dun sa reenactment, particularly, diba, nagkakaroon na ng re-emergence ng mga katawan. So ano naman yung pakahulugan nun um, dun sa commemoration at memorialization ng, ng history at ng colonial past? Siguro yun yung isa sa mga naisip ko from your project. Really good projects para kalimutan ko yung compliment. <laughs> really good project para very thought provoking at exciting sila. At ayun, tapos para din kay Miss Dondi, naalala ko lang na meron pala akong um kilala from UP, MA in performance studies siya. Na ang inaral niya ay yung commemoration ng pagdating ni Magellan sa Cebu, yung actual performance yeah. yung Mactan, Battle of Mactan commemoration. Yun yung thesis niya. Oh. Yung baka lang interesado ko na ano mag-network. Kineso. Kasi <laughs> <laughs> so, yung details niya mamaya. Yeah. Ayun yung naalala ko lang siya. So baka rin niya. Baka dahil magkaroon ng bagong pag-iisip tungkol dun sa, sa mga. Ayun. Anyway, pagod na. <laughs> <laughs> Para naman kay Ms. Arvin, again, really thought-provoking. <laughs> Ako. Uh, um, formal naman ni Iya. <laughs> Potensya na binabakala ko na yung buwan. Really thought-provoking. Ang paulit-ulit sa mga doon. Ayun, sobrang, um, there is a really strong English, there is a really strong decolonial um, sense than sa project. I feel like, um, not to impose or anything, pero ang gandang project of recuperation yung thinking through risk na ginagawa mo. And I feel like, 
echoing the name by Alex can sing sing just on base that space can be restrictive. Mm -hmm. I feel like if you also read on like the colonial perspectives, um and also come to understand that race is also like a modern colonial construct. Um may put professionalize the mm -hmm. Maui speakers, bahagi yun ng modern colonial project, um, assimilation sa kapitalist ng pamamaraan ng Maui speaking, di ba? Una, tapos pangalawa, may, may fixation din, um, may fixation din sila sa uh, pag-eradicate ng mga waste na katawan. Mm -hmm. So parang ayun din, uh, may, ang dami ng mga brambles dito ba? Ano natulad ko lang din na parang, Maganda, ang maganda rin siguro pag-isipan yung na ang waste ay katawan at yung katawan ay waste hindi lamang espasyo at yung katawan ay espasyo din yung katawan ay yeah. parang yung katawan bilang espasyo mm -hmm. ng, ng waste mm -hmm. so, hindi lang parang dialectical na waste space diba? may intervention lagi yung katawan so paano siya doon pumapasok sa purization mo um Ayun, tapos pagpapahingahin na yung mga patay. <laughs> Sinulad ko din, pagpahingahin na yung mga pagpahingahin na yung mga patay. <laughs> diba? Pero sobrang ganda. Tapos, ayun lang, uh, dagdag ko lang din na uh, while you're thinking about you know, possibilities and potentialities of waste speaking, what are the impossibilities of, mm -hmm. of waste speaking then? Siguro that's also a good um, thing to add to the mm -hmm. post, you know. Kita pag-usapan natin before, di ba? Ina-essentialize ba natin sila? Nero-romanticize mm -hmm. So ano naman yung, yung um, paano mo naman tutunggalitin din? Mm -hmm. So yun, yun lang po. Maraming salamat. Ayan, Arvin. Sabi sa sa'yo, hindi, em, hindi pang empty. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, Ian. Uh, you know, very interesting yung sinabi mo because I never thought of it na parang Reenactors are also, um, in a way, memory sites. They're also containers of uh, memory. Uh, I think I have to um, uh, think about that. Uh, I have, uh, yes, I'm sorry. I have to, to, to think about that. No, uh, but yeah, I read this a uh, part of my um RRL. Think of my notes. Go. Um, I, uh, part of my RRL, working RRL is um a, a dissertation. Um, on on uh, presencing, what he calls as a presencing of memory sites. I think um, he talks about how um, there are linkages or relationship uh, between and among different chosen texts of memory sites, such as, for example, commemoration and performance, and how these memory sites, in a way, support, enable, contextualize, or appropriate uh, the past and how in a way sometimes they also romanticize the past. So I think I have to also look at that. Kasi mag maganda. Ngay ngayon lang siya pumasok nga sa akin. Na. Within the, the, the public commemorations for example, there are also performances and reenactments. And you know, there's a living history society in, in the Philippines. Yung mga reenactors that they go to different places, they're wearing uh, itong mga Guardia Civil clothes and then they reenact a particular battle in the 1896 revolution. So yeah, so I think that's also counts as performance, right? So yeah, I think I have to uh, look at this idea of presencing also. Uh, so, and, and the commemoration outside of official uh, yung mga living history society. Yes, they are. They are most of them are non-government organizations. Yeah, mga parang mga history enthusiast lang sila. They come together and then they... So they do it mount... because they're not being paid to reenact. Yes, yes. Most of them. Tresinamiento Manila, boy. Ano? Tresinamiento Manila. Yes, for sure, eh. Yes, from... Oo, oh, oh, meron, meron kasi... From... Such as... Ang palaki yung topics. <laughs> Totoo din. So, yeah. So, dahil nga ang naging comment kanina ay marami na ako <laughs> titignan. So, baka uh, i-table ko yan when I talk to my uh, ad supervisors and how they look at it. Pero yun nga, baka maging bahagi siya ng scope and limitation ko ano ang baka. And for postdoc na yun. <laughs> Pero maraming salamat sa mga questions. Yes, Arvin. Yeah, totoo. Tama. Yung especially sa... 
like yeah with regards to waste as body and everything because i also realized that waste conceptualizing waste as space also diba, as much as i wanted to, i wanted to story waste picking as if they're side by side with waste to be side by side means there's divorce from each other paren. so yeah, i think yeah i'll think through it like how conceptualizing ways of body and all and and possible holes and possible possibilities and possibilities sa ganung theorization of ways of body and why would i take ways of space so i think very thankful for the comment to be able to really you know flesh out ways of space because it can have really you know limitations within it and for the what are the impossibilities uh, yeah true then pero uh, yeah true i mean because i adopted Josh Reno's thinking that scavenging is possible as possibility but to say as possibility it means possibility as in hope but possibility as in probability like there can even impossibility can arise in that possibility gets even possibility even possibility even it's not hope basically but the possibilities that could arise that even impossibility can arise in that possibility so yeah yeah framing the tama na yeah I will take that into account. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So question Um very interesting question. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Um, I think your questions are more on the methodological and your practical What is from which perspective is inspired or like which perspective is Actually, with regards to the methodology, I'm planning to employ ethnographic field work, like participant observation. I actually included it in the presentation, pero hindi ko na sinama. <laughs> pero oh, hindi ko na tinakos. So participant observation, interviews, yung life history and structure, some structure, follow the things. So yeah, especially when because we want to see how ways changes in space. So we are going to follow ways across spaces and how it changes across space and then archival research to situate why the present condition is like that and then objects and drawings and fgds to be reflexive in order for waste pickers you know they will take waste with them with them like in the fgd and they will discuss what does what does this waste they will take waste with them what does this waste mean to me like the emotions entangled with that material that they're taking so it can be anything else and all so I think I will story <clears throat> this thesis under the lens, I mean, through the perspective of waste pickers. I mean, I don't want to say through the lens of waste pickers because yun nga, but privileging of the human over the material. I don't know what perspective it's called, but I want, at least I want to highlight, you know, how waste pickers interact, how waste pickers and waste interact with, you know, all these like different ontologies of ways as this and that. So given that living with ways also requires the consequence of living with it, you know, ways is this and that. So yeah, I will also consider that. And actually that's what also my supervisor said about it's gonna be problematic in the ethics application, siguro kasi participant observation and ways picking. So yeah, maybe I will think it through then with the assistance of my supervisors. Kasi Kung paano maka lusot. Arvin, if Kim Dovey were here and he would, you know, he, he would hear you talk about the mythologies and tangibles, he would encourage you to adapt the framework of another, well, two dead friends, <laughs> <laughs> authors, uh, BNG, Denise and Gotar, and several things. Because they talk about intersections, the relations, and the Oh, 
I'm just gonna echo yung mga sinabi na kanina and congratulate the two of you on two very, very, very exciting um topics. And um uh, I like na nag-present kayong pareho because both of you um incorporate the idea of decentralizing your research. Um, for example, uh, you focusing on which papers of Palawan and yung sinabi kanina ni Dodi about uh, focusing on other narratives than yung the one presented, for example, pag Intramuros and at Manila. So you're, you're both moving away from the terminal, which I appreciate. Um, and as someone na ang research is sort of similar than uh, dealing with the word materiality a lot, so na ko din yung ano, you how both of you deal with the materiality and embodiment of um of seemingly abstract concepts, you know, like the yeah, waste or or history and memory. Ayun. So um you comment on Arvin and uh I don't know kung if if this will uh eh, kasi a lot of your talking points, you looking at waste as having um uh, waste and waste figures as having eight their own agency. Um I think baka mag benefit ka looking into material eco-criticism because material eco-criticism in particular looks at um, the non-human as having their own agency and able to tell their own narrative. Mm -hmm. And for me, being a creative writing, and ako, I find it also fascinating that you use the word story a lot in mm -hmm. your work. So since, uh, so, and binabagit, uh, when you look at material eco-criticism, binabagit nila si Deleuze and Guattari, um, may book na uh, material ay kompetisyon na yung title si uh, uh, Opperman and Iovino ang um, editors where well, sila <laughs> I don't think French sila <laughs> ayun um, and then yung uh, may concept na din ng vibrant matter ni Jane Bennett uh, and then I think si Karen Barat din um, y y y there, these are all names na may kinalaman sa um uh looking at the non-human as mm -hmm. as having their own agentic force since concern mo nga yung ano mm -hmm. paano mo babaybay you even you are doing ethnography uh, you're, you're doing participatory observation with, with people pero I, at the same time ayo mo rin eh gusto mo ring medyo decentralize yung human so mm -hmm. and since you mentioned the word entanglement sa lahat <laughs> so yung yeah, yeah. favorite word yan na pang ano mga <laughs> <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. mga, the, the beyond human, the more than human. Yeah. Yeah, yung uh, I'm uh, since mm -hmm. na bagit, eh, na and, and interesting that actually both of your work have uh the colonial potential din talaga. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, I, I don't know how much since you're doing comparative diba? So I don't know how much you're looking into the new since kanina uh, question ko rin kanina actually yung parang yung looking at yung reaction ng local uh yung relationship ng uh, ng local communities dun sa uh, uh ng local public sa monuments i'm also curious kung kung i-explore mo yon with the in, yung indigenous uh, Australian indigenous uh, perspectives on memorialization um merong libro <laughs> may basa na ngayon habang sa karma ko lang ano ang uh, picture um and that uh and title no libro ever win uh, mas mahaba pa yung title pero it, it it's about yung indigenous notion of time eh, and yung relationship nila sa yung yung their alternatives to for the for first nations kasi yung the act of memorization which nabanggit mo rin kanina but all all memorials all written history that already has an undercurrent of of colonization in it anyway um, and so, pati yung and related dun yung concept nila ng, ng history, time, and memory. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I don't know if that's something na baka masyado nang lalawak yung scope. Pero if you're gonna do the comparative, baka ano rin, uh, relevant din sa'yo na tingnan yung ano bang indigenous Australian perspective on history and memory. Kasi para sa kanila, di ba sinabi mo kanina, um, you want to make a distinction. Pero for them, the, those distinctions are not here, di ba? Yeah, so tapos din dadal ka na sa insight na hindi tinutukoy naman. Oh. Ah, dapat. Insights. 
Hindi <laughs> mong papadala na akong letter ng UP. Hindi ka na natapos siya. <laughs> okay. Ayan. So, Ayan. Anyway, Ayan. I think uh, mag- maganda yung idea na yun kasi to- i-coconnect ko din siya dun sa answer ko supposedly kanina. Um, dahil nga mag-foreground ako ng multiple voices. That includes yung uh, indigenous uh, indigenous voices dito rin sa Australia. Kasi um, ang expectation din sa aking thesis since this is bordering public history is to, uh, sa, sa huli, magbigay din ako ng insights ko on what to do with these sites now. I mean, um, kailangan ba itong mga sites na ito, i- 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 i-topple down natin itong mga monuments na ito or should they remain in their place and we just pro- um, erect a new mo- monument that would foreground, for example, indigenous voices. So yeah, I would also look at Uh, look at um this this um um aspect no yung mga indigenous um uh, perspectives kaya doon sa aking application din ng ethics ay mahalaga yun dahil kailangan ko din mag-interview so yeah so kukunin ko yung title ng book para mababasa ko rin so yeah maraming salamat ato meron na maraming salamat yeah so for me naman yeah Ay, <laughs> yeah, actually I encountered I encountered Jane Bennett pero yun, pero hindi ko pa siya nababasa pero I plan to read or uh, read uh, read through yung mga more than human especially kasi yun na uh, I also want to also, you know, story ways alongside ways picking and all. And kaso lang para para may sinabi si yung supervisor ko about uh vibrant mat I mean new materialism like sabi niya na sabi niya na wala lang like parang wag mo lang masyadong i theor- maging theoretical so yes syempre dapat i ground mo siya yeah. so yeah we'll read it through then how to you know bridge the reality with all these theories ko thank you sa mga suggestions baka may mga reading pa kayo na Char- yeah <laughs> So ready ka na September 15. Na, <laughs> shit. Ang daming comments ng draft ko. Pero, ano? <laughs> oh, ikaw. <laughs> May people have any questions from the... Are you wrong? Or from the wall? Parang lagi like sinasabi lang ng supervisor ka sa akin. Until you can describe and describe really well. Don't feel that. Mm-hmm. Uh, describe really well what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yun din yung sabi ni sa akin ni supervisor. Sabi niya na na wala pa like mag-ingat-ingat ka rin sa theory kasi wala pa ka pa sa field. Wala, so anything can change in the field. So that's why yeah, nung inisip ko yung base sa space para yeah. at least kapag mag sa field na ako. Pero ayun. Yeah. Like, yeah. For, for many of us early career mm. scholars, we can't get away with just you know letting theory do all the work. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, parang, parang at the outset, parang, the box mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it happened to me. I, I was romanticizing the democratic practice of street vendor. When I was in the field, I realized there are very exclusionary practices. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you also have to be very open minded once mm-hmm. you're outside. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How about that? Okay, 7 p.m. po. Um, Thank you. 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 Th